But for now, uh, let me share some of the, the wonder of the man himself and his teachings. And let me start by saying that in his understanding of contemplation, uh, he had in a way two bookends. And we're going to, for that reason, uh, start with one bookend and finish with one bookend. And so the, the first bookend is on uh, what he called centering prayer. And I'm going to unfold that with you in a moment. But centering prayer at one end and then the welcoming prayer at the other, which is how we're going to close today. So the key teaching that he had for us in the whole idea of being centered is he took the word communion and of course communion can be a loaded word and it depends on your tradition as to what it might mean but communion also very much means sort of togetherness with and he said that centering prayer doesn't focus on the communion the centering with but rather the union the togetherness so it's not like being alongside, but it's like being integrated with, not communion with the divine, but union with the divine. He said, and so many other traditions, of course, say the same thing. It's our true nature. And it's the understanding, the essence of what we know in English as transcendence. Allow me to share a couple of thoughts on that other great um, beautiful Catholic teacher that I think has had an effect on many of our lives, myself included, and that, of course, is Richard Rohr. And Richard Rohr describes Thomas Keating's centering prayer with these words. First of all, he says this. Contemplative prayer is entering a deeper silence and letting go of our habitual thoughts, sensations, feelings, in order to connect with a truth greater than ourselves. This is largely a practice of disidentification with our own compulsive thoughts and natures and feelings. And Richard said, most people do not see things as they are. Most people see things as they are. In other words, the seeing is not on the outside, but the seeing, of course, is through our own lenses. We see, of course, through our own agendas. And that, Richard said, and Thomas said, doesn't lead to a broad seeing. And let me give you a very um, clear example of that that happened in my own life. And I think that what I, the story I'm about to share, everyone will identify with in some way or other. But when I was in Sydney and I was contemplating leaving and returning to the States, because at that point, my life, and as I had known it, had completely imploded. And I was getting, as we always get, advice from every corner, whether I asked for it or not. <laughs> And of course, I had this concrete mixer of thoughts and feelings and questions and doubts and fears and anxieties. What's the right way? What's the right way? What should I do? On one morning, I would wake up clear and another morning I would wake up unclear and choose something else. I'm sure we all know what that feels like. And I remember after speaking with my uh, supervisor and my professor at university at the time, I remember surrendering. And here's the key word. I was on the bus back to work surrendering and I thought I can't keep trying to see it through my own eyes because I can't anymore. I, 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 I need a broader perspective. So there on that bus journey, I let go. I just completely let go. I thought, you know what? I'm going to surrender and life, divine source, whatever, it will become obvious to me. And it's, and, and I still remember it to this day. I got off the bus. 
I walked to the main road where I had to cross to get to my school. I pressed the, the button for the lights to change in order for me to use the pedestrian crossing. And as I did, the words, whether they were spoken, I don't know where they came from, were very clear to me. And the words were these, you will stay. Simple as that. And in that moment, I made the decision. And of course, it ended up being a life-changing decision because without that period in my life, I wouldn't be sitting here in front of you and sharing with you with the things that I've known and experienced since then. So Thomas said that in, if you like a religious language way, we're handing over to the divine, all of the negative, fearful, angry thoughts that try to grab hold of us. And when that stream of consciousness clears out, he says, and it does so sometimes clearly, as I've just explained to you, it's always a wonderful sense of the opening to the divine, to whatever the divine wants to say to us. Because basically, and here's the clincher, you're not in the way. And it reminded me of another very pivotal moment in my life. For those of you who are familiar with the Hindu temple in Queens, I don't know if anybody knows it, has been there, even knows where it is. In and of itself, it has the most remarkable story and history of how it came about being. But as part of my interfaith studies, I had to go and visit the temple. And it's a temple dedicated to Ganesh. Um, as we know him, of course, um, very often known as the remover of obstacles. And we got led around by a priest. And at the end of it, the priest said, and there were many, many, many statues of Ganesh. And the priest said, go and find a statue that speaks to you and go and speak to Ganesh and offer the things that are causing you trouble and angst and I remember I found one and I, at that time in my life, I was going through so many shifts and changes. And I remember pouring my heart out through the big elephantine ears of Ganesh on this statue. And I was asking Ganesh, please, please remove the obstacles, remove the obstacles. I need to be free, remove the obstacles. And I left it at that. We all took the subway home. And that was the end of my day. Well, sometime in dream time, I can't tell you when, I can't tell you at which point, whether it was waking or sleeping, but Ganesh actually appeared to me in my dream and said to me, Pippa, you've been ask, asking me to remove the obstacle. And I remember shaking my head vigorously. Yes, Ganesh, please remove the obstacles. And Ganesh leaned into me and said, but what if the obstacle is you? And I woke up and this was a turning point for me in terms of my understanding of how I had to get out of my own way. So let me share with you three small key teachings. Um, I could be here for the next month sharing all the beautiful gems that are in his many books and writings. But I, I chose three for today. And then I want to end with the welcoming prayer, the other bookend that I spoke of. So the first one is this. Father Thomas asked the question, so who are you and who am I? And this is, of course, the great question, the journey of our lifetimes. Well, as we know on this path, the spiritual path, the answer to that question is not our resume. It's not our ego. It's not the things that we can list. Well, I am this and this and this and this and this. Our accomplishments, our trainings, uh, the way that we identify ourselves. It's not even what we call the true self. It is, said Father Thomas, it's the surrendered. And it's the open 
self that is the most potent. That will make sense in a moment when I share the welcoming prayer. But that's it, that the true self is not what we think, but it, the actual, the surrendered, the open, almost, if you like, the empty. Now, as I said to you, he talked about not communion, but union, which Father Thomas said is transforming. And very often, and again, I have a feeling that I'm going to speak to every single one of us when I talk about what many of those in the mystical uh, and especially Christian traditions call the dark night of the soul. I don't even need to show us uh, a, a a show of hands, because I think it's something that at least once in our lifetimes we all have experienced. And very often people feel completely abandoned, abandoned by not just the people around us and, and by life, but even by the God, the God of our understanding. But, says Father Thomas, here's the clincher. This is the transforming moment. Because this is where, in the dark night of the soul, he says, we heal our mistaken identities of what God or the divine or source, whatever you want to call it, is. And that we might have brought with us, either through from our childhood or uh, teachings that we've interpreted from our denominations or our traditions or our families or our upbringings, so Father Thomas said, the atheists are right. There is no God. At least the one that we think or we thought we knew. In the dark night, he said, people sometimes feel that they've lost their faith in everything, including God, the divine, because everything that has supported that understanding and that identity has completely disintegrated. But here is the gem of the truth. And that's that the old one never existed anyway. And in that moment, almost like the rising dawn after the dark night of the soul, the true God of our understanding, the true divine is born. In other words, to use a Christian word, it's a resurrection. And the third teaching that I want to share with you is what he calls the veils of separation. In moments of awareness, awakenness, we have those little moments where we do feel like the veil of understanding, of separateness is, is parted, is lifted, is, is somehow um, a clearing has been made. But Father Thomas said, this is an illusion because in fact, there is no veil. We haven't been divided. We're not divided. We're not separated. We are not now, we have never been and we will never be. And that the true understanding of that, knowing that there is no veil is understanding that the divine is without and within, accompanying us and uh, companioning us at every step, every breath, every heartbeat, every thought, every word, every deed. In other words, there is no other, there is no separation, there's just oneness. So if I may, let me share now a little of the bookend, the other bookend of the welcoming prayer. I'll read it to you first. We're going to uh, share it together at the end. And it's quite radical. And one assumes that it's going to take a lifetime for any of us. And of course, even as I'm sharing these words with you today, I'm speaking very much to myself, someone who is grappling every day with how to incorporate and integrate these truths into my own life. But with that said, let me share 
his welcoming prayer. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I welcome everything that comes to me today because I know it's for my healing. I welcome all thoughts, feelings, emotions, persons, situations, and conditions. I let go of my desire for power and control. I let go of my desire for affection, esteem, approval, and pleasure. I let go of my desire for survival and security. I let go of my desire to change any situation, condition, person, or myself. I open to the love and the presence of the divine and divine action within. Amen. Now that word Amen, of course, in and of itself is in a way the essence of that welcoming prayer because the word translated into English basically means either let it be so or so be it, which goes back to what I was sharing earlier about Father Thomas's teaching on surrender being the openness. It is, to say it, radical, radical trust. So we will share in it at the end. And as I said, it's not easy. And he's never in any of his teachings ever said that it is. But it just starts with a willingness and it starts with an understanding that there is nothing that separates us from ourselves, us from each other, us from the life around us, and us from all that is. And I guess what better way to say than let it be so. Thank you. If you like this video, please like us on YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and click on the bell to be notified whenever we post a new video. Thank you.